I'm an old man now, and a lonesome man in Kansas, but not afraid to speak my lonesomeness in a car, because not only my lonesomeness, it's ours all over America. Oh, tender fellows, and spoken lonesomeness is possible. Allen Ginsberg, I don't even know where we met. It goes way back, and then when I got to Lower East Side, his apartment was down the street. The Beatniks had a philosophy that he told me that when you first get to a city, you should live in the down and out part of the city where the poorest people live. He said if you really want to understand a city, live at the bottom first, and then wherever you go after that, you'll have a lot of insight. And that's proven true. When I lived in Havana, people were surprised where I lived in central Havana. But I had a real understanding of the kind of the gritty reality of a certain Havana. Ginsburg would pop into the rat and we would talk as he was ambling about town. He and his lover Peter Orlovsky were playing the harmonium a lot and doing Buddhist chants. He would show up at like street actions, anti-war actions, civil rights actions, and there he'd be with his harmonia. And harmonium is a squeezy Indian instrument that's a little bit like an accordion, um, and chanting and getting people to chant and creating good vibes. The best thing I got from Ginsburg at the beginning was the lore of New York, World War II, when GIs came back from Europe and had been in the war and the black GIs that lived in Harlem had seen a completely different world, not so racist and not so segregationist. And there was a lot of political ferment in Harlem, 46, 47. And then cheap heroin was introduced or maybe the police just stopped enforcing laws on the heroin dealers, but the heroin dealers uh, flourished and it bought off a whole lot of the anger and um, resonance because people were mellowed out on junk. In the nuclear war era where we were having mutual assured destruction with the Russians and we were going to blow up the whole world to prove that America was right and all of that, they had air raid drills in New York. and. You go down in the subways, which are not deep in New York, and they'd have an air raid drill, and everybody on the streets were supposed to go down in the subways. And it was crazy because you'd be incinerated if a nuclear bomb hit Manhattan, or the rest of New York, for that matter. And some beatniks refused to go down. Challenged just by sitting at a picnic table in the park while everybody else was ducking cover and hiding under there, supposedly down in the subways. And then the press would ask them and they'd say, people, it's crazy. So if we go to a nuclear war, we're incinerating it all and um, that's no protection whatsoever. It's uh, the illusion of protection. That was a very powerful political action by the beatniks because Nobody would conceive of doing that at that time, and that was in the 50s. In our culture, lots of guys don't have mentors. Their dads are crappy mentors. They're ill at ease at talking about real stuff. Dad will talk about football or something like that, but if a son is artistic or yearning or creative or trying to figure out the meaning of life, dads usually aren't very lucky. Uh, bets to tell you how, how everything works. Particularly in that era, 50s going into the 60s, I never really had a dad, so lots of people moan, and, oh God, I was raised by a single parent and all that. I always thought it was tremendously lucky. I didn't have the dad voice in my head wagging his finger and like, you little pipsqueak, you aren't out there doing whatever being tough man stuff. You aren't deer hunting. You aren't wanting to shoot commies. You don't want to play football in business. You're going to fail because you're not positive enough. You're too weird. 
I didn't have those voices in my head, and so many of my male friends did. They were screwed up by their dads, and so, in a way, it was great not to have a dad as a mentor. But at another level, Allen Ginsberg was a dad, was a mentor, a guy who you could talk to about anything and would tell you what he thought. Doesn't mean he was always right, but he certainly would. And so I was tremendously lucky knowing Alan and the other guys. And Alan was in his Buddhist phase, which lasted all the rest of his life. And so he would talk about things like compassion for all creatures. And in politics, he wanted enlightenment. He didn't want just changing the, who was in power. And so Alan was the genuine deal because he introduced me to Burroughs and all the rest. But he also was in the forefront of all kinds of demonstrations. I remember we all got busted at a anti-war demonstration and everybody was going pacifist limp, Martin Luther King style. And the cops, it's a hot day, and the cops have to throw us in the paddy wagon. And even if we weren't big bulky guys, throwing a 150 pound guy into a paddy wagon who's not cooperating with his body muscles is a chore, even if there's two of them. And then about the 20th one, the cops are tired and pissed off and it's not fun. They're working dudes who have to throw bodies into paddy wagons, like big lumps of bags of coal or something. And we're sitting there and I knew the cops were pissed off. When we get to the precinct station, we're getting hauled out of the paddy wagons which pissed them off more because nobody was stepping down out of the paddy wagon. They were getting drug out and carried. Um, and Alan had a hernia and he's always talking about talking to the human being inside everybody. So he's saying, I've got a hernia, I've got a hernia. Be careful. And I thought he was just nuts. I thought, boy, these guys are gonna beat him up worse because he's weaker. Often weakness brings out brutality and sadists. But it worked perfectly. They <laughs> passed him gently to the ground rather than threw him like a big bag of beans or something. And I started thinking, oh, it's interesting. I didn't think it worked all the time, but it was an interesting approach. And so both by stories that he told, like stories about in the late 50s, Times Square was the gay pickup place and gay culture was totally oppressed. And he would, he and his friends would go up there and it was just like another underground, secret signs of recognition. And you would link up with other gays in Times Square. And to hear those kind of stories there's a functional underground. And so when we were making other undergrounds like the anti-draft underground, uh, we could take lessons from the gay underground in New York in the 50s. And so they had lots to teach. Not the empty sky that hides the feeling from our faces, nor our skirts and trousers that conceal the body love emanating in a glow of beloved skin. White, smooth abdomen down to the hair between our legs. It's not a god that bore us that forbid our being, like a sunny rose all red with naked joy between our eyes and bellies. Yes, all we do is for this frightened thing we call love, want and lack. Fear that we aren't the one whose body could be beloved of all the brides.